I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. We have a special episode for you out today, especially considering that Pratik is out sick. We have a star guest to make up for him. We've got Mr. Javed Rehmat and we've got Sapnil, our usual ATP podcaster on tech. And we're going to be talking about surveillance. It's something that we haven't talked about in a while. We've talked about a bunch of stuff like competition law, like privacy, like information disorder. But surveillance is somehow that subject that always seems to be something we want to talk about but are unable to. Thankfully, we've got two bona fide experts here with us to do exactly that. So let's sort of start off with a somewhat current peg. The New York Times recently came out with an investigation on Pegasus and the NSO group and their dealings with different countries. I thought it was extremely fascinating and and uses and, and sort of could use some more light, especially on this podcast. So Sapna, why don't you take us to what the investigation was? Thanks, Rohan. Basically the idea of Pegasus and how it has been working that's been in the public domain for quite some time though I think almost five years. But the way NSO Group has functioned and how it's been more or less a bunch of complicated and it's been behind the clouds for the same amount of time. So I think sometime in the last week of January, New York Times did this sort of investigative reporting on how NSO functions and what sort of dealings NSO has. And even particularly they take a very uh, American point of view, of course, about how the dealings have happened between the American government, I mean, the American uh, administration, as well as how things have played out in that space. So they talk about how their functioning, uh, how the functioning of NSO's Pegasus and its deployment happens and how and why in, in obviously a new breakthrough that the US government had constantly spoken about how they have not used it and then there has been quite a bit of uproar after the forbidden stories of investigation that happened that people have been accusing there have been accusations against multiple countries but US has been somehow away from all of this more or less but through this investigation it also came out that US was also involved in trying out the use of the SBI had also brought a version of Pegasus and they were trying out trying this out in specific areas and while somehow they ended up not making the full purchase and not deploying it full time. But that brings us to a very interesting point in time where we, we've had at least through this time, we've had multiple, con- we've also had conversations where we've mentioned how NSO was blacklisted by US and things like that have happened. So the, the it presents a context that we were not privy to earlier. And with that, alongside, we also get the idea of how Israel has used this as a diplomatic tool and also a little bit of background about how Israel has used arms as a diplomatic tool for quite some time. And this particular cyber weapon is now one of its most effective diplomatic tools, ranging from their conversations with UAE to India to all. Uh, to a lot of to a lot of their partners and allies. So that is broadly what the particular investigation gives us. And it also gives us a very poignant, I mean, very relevant for our interest is how Mr. Modi and Mr. Netanyahu met. And after that, there were conversations happening in the idea of India having access to Pegasus and that somehow clarifies where in, in our current situation, so where I'm, I'm sure our listeners are aware that the Supreme Court has a committee which is looking into the deployment of Pegasus and while the government of India has not has neither accepted nor denied the use of Pegasus, we have some word of, I mean, I think I wouldn't be jumping too much to saying it if I say there is some sort of a compelling evidence, circumstantial evidence, suggesting that the Indian government had bought it and is had... I and mean, if it is bought it, probably 
the government has also tried to deploy it. If I mean, obviously, Mr. Ambed, if you want to add something more, some more context to it, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, Rohan, and thank you, Satni. See, the first thing that one has to say is that any sovereign country, and that includes us as well, India, has uh, responsibilities of defense of the territory and ensuring that the national interest is safeguarded at all times. And in that context, every country does do surveillance. That is one of the tools of statecraft. So if we have to understand that, we have to accept that. Now, having said that, even surveillance has to have certain guidelines. It has it has to have certain limitations. It has to have certain rules uh, by which the game is played. Now, in the Indian context, the problem with Pegasus is as follows. Till this particular application came about uh, to be available to India, there were other methods and uh, technologies that were used for surveillance, for legal legal surveillance, which was done in the official capacity by officials after taking permissions. The problem with Pegasus arises is that Pegasus can override every rule that has been framed for surveillance by the Indian government. And I suppose it overrides the rules that have been made by most governments across the world. Because the very nature of this application is such that it does not have to have any uh, any particular action being taken by the state. They just have to deploy it and they can deploy it without any linkage with any official work or with any official record. That is basically the problem. And that is the problem of fundamental right of privacy, the fundamental right of not allowing the state to peep into your daily life or whatever you may be doing of, of your of your expression, of your belief, of your talking to people. So it has what can be called the chilling effect on democratic rights of individuals in, in a democracy like India. And that is where the problem is. That That is one aspect of it. Let me quickly also add that the surveillance rules and surveillance laws that prevail in India, or rather prevail in India as on, the, as on date, they, they themselves have many lacunas. And there are many aspects of that that need to be revised, that need to be made more in tune with our democratic setup and also in tune with a very important judgment about privacy given by the Supreme Court in the Puttaswamy case, where they said that proportionality is a very important aspect, that the legality of the surveillance, the proportionality of the surveillance and also of fixing accountability or responsibility. All these three parameters, which are critical now for any surveillance to happen, have been, in a, in a sense, overridden by the application of this new technology called Pegasus. And this is a military-grade application, and using such military-grade application for surveillance of individuals who have no national security threat has very serious implications. Thanks, Mr. Amber. I think that's especially when you talk about proportionality and legality um, of infringements on our fundamental right to privacy. I think it's um, Pegasus, at least in my head, sort of violates those those guidelines. But we'll we'll talk about this more. Let's take a quick commercial break and then we'll come back and talk about how Pegasus operates and checks and balances in general. Hey, everybody, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On Think Fast, Namit Potna is a good friend of mine, founder of Drumworks, joins Varun and Suchita. He talks about all things NFT and shares a few tips on investing. On Pesa Vesa, Anupam and Devina Mehra, founder at First Global, discuss the outlook for the Indian equity market in 2022. On the Filter Coffee Podcast, Karthik talks to author Rashna Bisht about her book, 1971, Charge of the Gorkhas. On all things policy, the Takshashila 4 contemplate the need for Indian health services in current times. And on Say No to Drama, Chetna pulls down the curtain around nostalgia and teaches us how to live in the present. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Also, please do tell a friend. It really does help us when you spread the word about our podcast. And I'd also like to ask you if you could rate or recommend wherever you listen to our podcast. And speaking of where you listen to this show, if you're on an Android phone, do check out our new Android app. We have a brand new app with a brand new listening experience. Definitely check it out. I think you will enjoy it. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Bank of Baroda and CoinSwitch Kuber. Thank you so much for making this possible. 
Hi, we're back talking about surveillance and Pegasus with Mr. Javed Ahmed and Sapni. And before we sort of talk about checks and balances, which is eventually what I want to talk about, let me just sort of describe Pegasus to you. So the version of Pegasus that we're sort of talking about was quote-unquote zero-click. So unlike more common hacking software, it did not require users to click on a malicious attachment or a link. So you basically couldn't, you couldn't know that Pegasus was on your phone in a sense. And so... Let's say Americans monitoring phones uh, could not see evidence of an ongoing breach, for example. You couldn't see Pegasus computers connecting to a network of servers around the world, hacking the phone, connecting back to the equipment at whoever the buyer of the, the software was. But what you could see after was every piece of data stored on the phone as it unspooled into large monitors of Pegasus computers. Every email, photo, text thread, personal contact, the phone's location or take control of the camera or microphone. And basically, you could transform phones into surveillance tools, which is very frightening to hear considering most people in our generation and in other generations are on their phones all the time. So it's it's quite a daunting prospect to just think about. And so while, while I was going through this report, I, a few things struck out at me. So Pegasus was used, uh, it, it played a critical role in securing the support of Arab nations in Israel's campaign against Iran, even negotiating the Abraham Accords, the 2020 diplomatic agreements that normalized relations between Israel and some of its longtime Arab adversaries. But at the same time, the NSA group uh, was quite cautious when it came to sort of spying on American citizens. And it was sort of a sort of a test building exercise, if you would, with the US. And it, it the investigation does a great job of detailing this. I'm not going to give out all the meat over here. But so this sort of brings me to checks and balances, right? Most of these countries that bought Pegasus, but I see a common trend of there not being a lot of checks and balances in how it was going to be used. And more often than not, the usage was political. And, and you could say, like, at least in my eyes, surveillance is malicious. And the uses of this tool as well was fairly malicious. So you guys want to elaborate more on how checks and balances work when it comes to surveillance and uh, and how they should work? Okay. Uh, so you hit the nail on the head, Rohan. The basic problem with Pegasus is that it is such a powerful tool. And it is given to only the uh, sovereign states, as we all know. It is such a powerful tool that... It is liable to be misused. Now there are reports that even in, in Israel, there have been reports of it being misused. The uh, Americans finally started taking notice of this tool only when they realized the potential and the huge potential of, of its misuse. Because you know, that old adage about uh, power corrupting and absolute power corrupting absolutely, this tool is so powerful that it has the potential to just uh, you know, can court the people in authority to misuse it. Now, in the case of Pegasus, what happens is that, as I said earlier, whatever rules have been framed and however, however inadequate they may be, you can just bypass them. So there will be no official record of who has been chosen for surveillance, why he has been chosen for surveillance, who has authorized it, how long will the surveillance happen. And then equally importantly, once you have that data, Who's going to have a look at it? And once you had a look at it and decided whether the, the, the concerned person is good or bad, do you, who destroys it? Who ensures that it is destroyed? Does it fall into some other new hands who then use, use it for some other nefarious purpose or even to blackmail you for that matter? These are the issues that uh, will come up when the official processes are bypassed. And that is what is happening. And that is what is, as I said, the most frightful thing about this. Sapni, would you like to add? I think I just uh, jump back into the checks and balances point, and rightly, as Mr. Javik and with uh, pointed out, e- even within the system that we currently have, right? So we we go back to uh, the basics. The basics is obviously the right to privacy, and that's the the absolute, absolutely ignoring the existence of uh, any right to privacy. Any any reasonable right to privacy is what happens with the deployment of a tool like this. So. Here we go back to the Indian ones. We go back to the Indian situation. We do as, as rightly as Mr. Ahmed pointed out, and you also, Roman, you and you spoke about weak set of frameworks which have minimal effect in preventing anything like this. So in India, at least, even once we go back to uh, the Puttaswami judgment, the four-part test, basically, that's 
talks about proportionality, legality, there being procedural or sort of guarantees that can prevent invasion into privacy. And obviously the ultimate point of legitimate goal, there being some sort of legitimate goal into infringing privacy at any scale. So here the legitimate goal point comes back to uh, national interest and national security, which is what the government has uh, time and again tried to present in front of the courts and, and, and to the public at large, right? So, but whether this legitimate goal exists or not, and what the actual purpose of this legitimate goal is, is something we need to sort of think about and, and analyze given, and, and that's where this particular investigation brings context, I believe, because of how Mexico sort of used it and how, how there is, how the report, I mean, we'll definitely be linking the report to the show notes, but as the, as the listeners can obviously read it, it sort of, the, the thread sort of connects through to how it's ease of misuse in a tool like this is something that procedural safeguards should be cognizant of. And that is a place where we lack very bad, at least in, in India, we lack very badly. So we are procedural safeguards is a, a, a barely enunciated framework under the Telegraph Act where and the wiretapping bunch of wiretapping related laws those are possibly laws that fit really well for the age of telegram the actual thing and not telegram the app so that sort of difference is not something our laws have kept up with and which with that a good bunch of procedural safeguards which ought to exist they are completely gone and Another important matter when it comes to the idea of surveillance and it comes to this assertion of national security is how these sort of tools, as, as Mr. Ahmed rightly pointed out, it's, it's a military grade tool. So the, the use of these sort of tools should be regulated with some sort of a framework. But when it comes to India, again, we do not have any, any framework that regulates our intelligence agencies. So if there is the FBA, FBI in the, in the US and they have a set of regulations, the equivalent here in our, in our country, the IB and the RAW, et cetera, they do not have any sort of legal framework within which they have to work. So that, that lack of supervision, that lack of legal limitations on them is also something I, I identify as something that contributes to misuse, I think, at, the, at this scale. So those are, those are the hard questions that such an incident opposes at us that and those are questions which we should be thinking about and and worried about because as Mr. Ahmed rightly started with talking about the chilling effect right so if this sort of a practice is used more than anything else it contributes immensely to chilling any sort of conversations and and I'm sure Mr. Ahmed can point out to how you know there can be immense law and order related concerns, immense concerns, democracy in itself and the exercise and the activity of democracy that we see in the country. So that, that I think is funny. That should concern all of us. Thanks for that, Sapni. I really, the importance of oversight, both parliamentary and judicial sort of cannot be overstated as it were. But I'm cognizant of the amount of time we have and we don't have much. So before we end, do you guys have any concluding remarks that we should end with? Let me let me end by saying that Pegasus has only highlighted the very flimsy regulations that we have on surveillance. Pegasus is a very powerful tool and through this expose and, and this controversy, it is time that the surveillance rules and the systems are made uh, are made more in tune with the democratic uh, uh, republic like India. Just to give you an example, the rules as they are today don't really distinguish between a law and order problem, for example, a kidnapping or a or a communal riot and national security. The, the kind of permissions that are required for a, a local law and order problem are the same, the same standards are there for a, a local problem, law and order problem, and a real terrorist threat, for example. Obviously, there is a need for 
uh, different categories of permissions, different categories of regulations for different levels of threat. And by putting them all together and by giving uh, access for uh, permission for surveillance to various, you know, dozens of uh, dozens of organizations across the country, we have allowed uh, uh, surveillance to be done in, if I can call it, call it so, in a very flippant manner, in a less than serious manner, uh, in a manner that probably would have been, would have been, uh, you know, excusable uh, in a non-democratic setup. And also excusable because of the limitations of technology in the maybe 20 years ago, when technology did not have this kind of power. But now with this kind of powerful technology, it is time that things change. And Pegasus is a very timely reminder us to all of us to kind of put our uh, house in order so that democracy and everything that it implies is safe. Thank you, Sam. That's profound, actually. Sapni, do you want to end with some concluding thoughts? I don't think I could have put it better than how Mr. Ahmed has talked about you know, the implications of democracy and, and how we should put our house in order. And I mean, I'll, I'll just get back to the point that this brings out is how we should be aware and cognizant of the changes around us and our laws. I mean, our, we should ensure that our representatives are on their toes when it comes to regulations and that it does not lag behind almost centuries to technology because we frankly do not have that sort of space to say about democracy if, if our representatives and we as people are not aware and making things change as soon as we can. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, Mr. Ahmed, and thanks, Sapni. It was a pleasure talking to both of you. And thanks, Jayasna, for listening to All Things Policy. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in. Working Monday to Friday glued to your chair making you feel dull? Worry not. Get your 5-minute weekly dose of travel around the world with postcards from nowhere. Join me every Thursday as I explore the strange, obscure and fascinating parts of the world and bring out facets of travel you may not have thought of before. You can find us on the IBM Podcast app, website or wherever you get your podcast from. Don't you think that if everyone around you is getting smart, you better be smarter? Hey there, I'm the traveling professor Siddharth Deshmukh and I'm back with season 2 of my podcast to make you smarter. Smarter with Sid. What's this season's focus about? Well, it's about 10 minute nuggets that will make you stand out at work. It's time to go from smart to smarter. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday and become smarter with Sid.